And there are a couple of things we're going to be doing with our lesson today. One is we're going to be working with a formula very similar to the formula for the period of oscillation of a mass on a spring. We will have a formula for the period of oscillation of a pendulum. And then we're also going to be determining the restoring force of a pendulum. We already have calculated restoring forces of masses on springs. It's just F equals KX. And because a spring mass system oscillates back and forth in a line, there are really no vectors involved. I mean, I suppose, you know, if, if my chin is the equilibrium position, there are vectors involved in that displacements over here are negative and displacements over here are positive. With a mass on a spring, if the spring is to the left of the equilibrium position, then the force is positive because it's acting to the right. If the mass is to the right of the equilibrium position, then the force on it is to the left. There is some vector component to what's going on here. But it's linear. You either have positive forces or negative forces. Because a pendulum moves in a circular arc, the restoring force is not as simple. To begin with, here's the formula. It really is quite similar in structure to the period of a mass on a spring. It's period equals 2 pi times L over G under the square root, whereas for the mass oscillating on a spring, it's M over K under the square root. But there's an issue here with this formula, and I don't think we need to get into it. I, if, if you're curious about it, we can have a private conversation, or, or we can talk about it near the end of today's class. But this formula has limitations to it. And it isn't that 15 degrees is etched in stone in the universe somewhere, that as soon as you hit 15 degrees, the formula breaks down. The formula is not really valid at all. Okay, I'll, I'll give you a brief explanation of why. The formula is not really valid at all. But for small enough angles, it works. And the reason has to do with the difference between sine of an angle and tangent of an angle. Okay. And that sine of an angle and tangent of an angle for small angles are pretty darn close. And I see some of you grabbing your calculator right away to check that out. Make sure your calculator is in degrees unless you want to work in radians, which I don't think any of you know about yet. So, I mean, if I take sine of 2 degrees, it's this number. If I take tangent of 2 degrees, it's this number. They're very, very close. They are not equal. Okay? Now, it turns out, and I have to think about this, it turns out that the correct formula would make use of tangent, whereas this formula ends up making use of sine, I believe. I have to draw a vector diagram to confirm that, but it doesn't matter. The correct formula would make use of, yeah, it would make use of tangent. But as we will see later, when you have a pendulum moving, it's very difficult to measure lengths on the forces that would result in a tangent of an angle. But it's very easy instead to measure the length of the pendulum. And if you use the length of the pendulum in the formula, you end up using sine of the angle. So the true, the true formula involves tangent. But it's easier to calculate sine in an experiment. I want to show you that as this angle gets bigger, so the true formula is tangent. I'll start with tangent here. If you had tangent of 5 degrees, and I compare it to sine of 5 degrees. Remember, the formula uses sine. They're still pretty close, aren't they? But if I were to go, I don't know, tan of 25 degrees and sine of 25 degrees, we start to get a difference that's significant. And I can show that to you graphically. I'm trying to draw some connections here between physics and math. All you need to know is it's only valid for less than 15 degrees. And by the way, I think there's a typo in your handout. That's why I've got this highlighted. It probably says that. 
should say than. Um, I, I'm just drawing some connections here between math and physics. That if I were to graph y equals tan of x, and this is going to show a graph of the true nature of the equation, and then I'm going to graph y equals sine of x, and this is the lousy version. This is, don't worry about what I'm doing here, this is going to graph what the equation actually does that, we're, that we got on our formula sheet, which is not valid all the time. And I'm going to graph these from 0 to 90 degrees. No, I better not even go 90. 45 degrees. And I'm going to go from uh, 0 up to 1. That's what the tangent function looks like, and that's valid. Here's what the sine looks like. And you can see that it's starting to deviate away from the true function. And what we have decided, or not we, it's not like they called me into a meeting, somebody has decided that 15 degrees is the cutoff. We can, we can accept the discrepancy up to about 15 degrees, but past that, it's no longer valid. So there's a mathematical reason. You will run into the same problem. How many of you are going to take Physics 30, you, you think? Okay. You'll run into the same issue with Physics 30 dealing with interference of light and some formulas. Anyway, this is important not for any of the problems we do, but it's important because when you do a lab next week, you have to remember that your pendulum has to be less than 15 degrees. This is 15 degrees away from the vertical. So before we get to some examples, let's put this to the test. I have my pendulum here, and I'm putting this here. I'm going to put this here for a couple of reasons. One of the reasons I'm going to put it here, no. The main reason I'm going to put it here is so that if you can't even see the pendulum moving, you can see it moving here. And you're going to be measuring the period, but you're going to measure it for, let's go, Let's go five again, because it's less time. And I do have some of these, if anybody wants some of these. The batteries have been replaced, so I don't have enough for everybody. But you can use your phone or a actual stopwatch. You want one? You guys got phones out. And I guess if I want to use this put this to the test, the thing I can do is say, well, what's g supposed to be equal to? So I'm going to measure the length of this pendulum. We're going to measure the period. We're going to do a calculation to see if we get g. I guess maybe before we do that, if t equals 2 pi root l over g, then t squared equals 4 pi squared l over g. I square everything. When I rearrange that, I get g equals 4 pi squared l over t squared. So I'm going to start off with this one, and we're going to measure the, I'm going to measure the length. I'm not going to worry about precision here. Okay? Precision will be when you do the lab on your own. And I'm going to try to measure l from the pivot point. And you're going to measure, when you do the lab, you want to measure to the center of the mass of the pendulum, and I'm going to say it's 2.28 meters. It was 2 meters plus 28 centimeters. So I'm going to get it in motion, and I'm going to go a little bit bigger than 15 degrees. I mean, I think that might be closer to 20, but I want you to be able to track it a little bit better. And again, you can start your time wherever you like, but you will start it when it's at the top, of one side, and that will be zero, and then when it reaches the top again, that's one, and you count off to five. With this long of a pendulum, which you will not have a long pendulum like this, 
Okay, the period is quite long. So there's less error here. I got 15.1 seconds for five complete back and forths. What did you get, Owen? 15.2. 15.2. 15.1. So let's go with 15.2. It doesn't really matter. Um, we're off by a tenth of a second or two tenths of a second for five oscillations, so it's not going to matter. I'm going to go with 15.2. I need to divide that by five and get 3.04 seconds, I believe. That's right. So I'm going to throw this in here into this formula. I have 4 times pi squared times, I said, 2.28, I believe, divided by 3.04 squared. That's, that's pretty good, really. Considering the simplicity of this, we didn't have to use ticker tape or some kind of ramp and launch, launch a ball off of a big height so we could measure the time accurately. Uh, if you're looking at a percent error, if I subtract 9.81 from that and I, and I then divide by 9.81 and then multiply by 100, that is phenomenal. It's less than a percent error. Let's try one more, but I'm going to change the length. And this will require a little bit more ingenuity on my part to be able to measure the length. Can somebody bring me that meter stick? <laughs> Thank you, Christina. I probably have another one somewhere. I appreciate that. So. Uh, I'm going to go 1.62. I, I would like to crouch down and, and read that a little more accurately, but I don't want to change the length, right? So I'm holding this. There's enough, there's enough friction here that you know, I don't have to really pull on it, and it's not going to move unless I really let go or really pull. So... Set my stopwatch. And again, I'm going a little bit more than 15 degrees. We'll talk more about that in a second. I feel as though I, stopped, I started my stopwatch a little late, so I tried to end it a little late as well. That's not really good science, but I have 13.19 seconds. What did you get? 12.93. 12.83? Okay, so I'm going to go with you guys. I started, I started late, and I tried to overcompensate by ending late, but I think my ending late was too far late. So 12 point, let's just go with 12.9 seconds. So we do have to divide that by 5. And I've long since forgotten what I said, 1.62. And that's, take that measurement with a grain of salt, because I was, you know, in an awkward position physically to measure that. So 4 pi squared times 1.62 divided by 2.58 squared. Still pretty good. I have a feeling that the length I gave you was maybe a little too short because I was looking at the ruler from an angle and I couldn't see where the center of the ball was. But anyway, I'm not going to make excuses here. That's really good. It's 2% error. And by the way, it's, each of these were negative. So the percent er error here is negative 2%. 
final comment before we try some questions on our own with a calculator. Do you see, forgetting about why this is the case or which one is right, do you see that they only really start to move away from each other past about here? Like it's visually apparent there. Well, I've scaled this to 90 degrees. So, fifteen degrees is here. That fifteen degree benchmark is being generous. I've seen university physics textbooks that say you can go up to twenty or twenty five. So even though I went past fifteen, I think that's not where the source of error is. I think it's elsewhere. So let's take a look at now at the examples. Determine the period and frequency of a 2.5 meter long pendulum. Well, we are definitely going to go with an assumption here that it is on Earth. There's no reason to suppose it's not on Earth. fix this. So this is just a matter of using the formula. The period will be 2 pi root L over G. I'm not even going to bother writing the numbers in here. 2 pi square root 2.5 meters divided by 9.81 uh, I don't know, does, does anybody remember what the length of my pendulum was the first time I did this? Was it 2.28? So a little bit less than this. What the period, if it were 2.5, would be, would be 3.2 seconds, and we got 3.04 or something. So that's the answer to the question, 3.2 seconds. Number two, pendulum on Earth has a period of three seconds. How long is it? Well, look, we know it's going to be right around two and a half meters because this had a period of 3.2 seconds. This is just giving us practice in taking this formula. Squaring both sides to get t squared equals 4 pi squared L over g. We want the length, so I have to multiply the t squared by g and divide by 4 pi squared, and this will be the length. And, and again, we've come a long way. I, I, if it's a written response problem or an assignment or a quiz or something, you want to show your work, but the physics is done. Now it's just a matter of using your calculator, right? So I don't care if we write down the numbers especially when we're in learning mode and I'm in teaching mode. So 3 squared uh, times 9.81 divided by, of course, don't, don't go divided by 4 pi squared. Go divided by, in brackets, 4 pi squared or divide it by 4 and also divide it by pi squared. So I get 2.2 meters. Any questions with two? All right, three. A 50 centimeter long pendulum is swinging on the surface of a planet with a mass of 2.8 times 10 to the 22 kilograms and a radius of 4.3 times 10 to the 5 meters. I don't know if any of the Mars landers have ever done this, but it would be a very, very simple way to determine properties of a planet by looking at a pendulum. You could certainly take a pendulum on a planet, set it in motion, and within five minutes know the acceleration due to gravity on the planet. And then if you knew the radius, which you can determine using geometry and shadows and stuff, which we don't learn about, but it's possible, then you can determine the mass of the planet. Here we're working backwards. We have both. You should know that gravitational field strength 
This goes back to unit three, circular motion and gravitation. No, unit two, dynamics and gravitation. We learned how to calculate gravitational forces between masses, and then we learned about gravitational field strength. So we need to calculate the gravitational field strength first on this planet. We're going to take Newton's universal law of gravitation, multiply by the mass of the planet, divide by the radius of the planet squared, and get about 10.1 meters per second squared, or newtons per kilogram. A relatively comfortable planet for us to walk around on the surface of, because we're used to 9.81. Does anybody else get the same acceleration due to gravity? Okay. So we have that. Now all we have to do is tumble that. I'm going to use newtons per kilogram. Tumble that or send it through this formula. So two pi, whoops, pi root L is 0.5 meters. It's 50 centimeters, but we have to use standard units, divided by our acceleration due to gravity, about 1.4 seconds. Imagine a planet with one-tenth the mass. So you don't have to change anything in your notes. We're done with this example. But imagine that this was, oh, let's go 10 to the 20. Imagine that was the mass of the planet. What would the period of the pendulum be? Because we can visualize 1.3 seconds. I mean, that I got a pretty good handle on that. Well, the acceleration due to gravity on that planet would be found in the same way we just did. Is that my phone? Yeah. Hello. Okay, so um, this is what I would get, which would be very unsafe for us to walk around on this planet, especially if you had a skip in your step because you'd push yourself away from the planet and you'd start going away from the planet. It would take a very long time for you to come down. You could just hop from here to Miss McFeely's classroom probably. Uh, but when you come down, you have inertia, so you can really hurt yourself. Right? Even though you may not be moving that fast, you do have inertia. What would... What would the period be? 2 pi... 2 pi... Try that a third time. Root L divided by the answer. 14 seconds. So you have a pendulum which is this long that's 50 centimeters and it would take 14 seconds for it to go from here well, I'm not even going to try to do that because my back is getting sore. All the way to there and all the way back would take 14 seconds. You can do a similar calculation, and we're not going to, but if you did a similar calculation, you 
There we go. And maybe multiply the mass of the planet by 100 and use the mass of the planet as that. See what you would get. The period would be very tiny. I don't know what it would be. Definitely less than a second, maybe less than a hundredth of a second. You can do that calculation on your own. Any questions with number three? All right, we have one more little detail we need to talk about, which is the restoring force of a pendulum. The equilibrium position of a pendulum, geez, after all that, I'm going to put it back. The equilibrium position of a pendulum of this pendulum is essentially where it is right now. Right? And the, the fact of the matter is the reason why it does what it does is because at every point in its motion, at every point in its path or position, there is a force pulling it towards the equilibrium position. But you need to understand that this is a circular arc. So it isn't that it isn't that you have the pendulum at let's say that's a circular arc it isn't that you have a pendulum here and the force is directed directly to there it's not the force is directed along the path so the equilibrium position is arrived at by forcing the pendulum when it's here in this direction and when the pendulum is here in this direction and when the pendulum is here in that direction. Now do you, do you notice that I drew these forces different lengths? Well it's the same kind of thing as with a spring. The further away from the equilibrium position you are the more force is being applied. So we have a question here. What causes the restoring force? And you could probably answer that without talking about the circular arc and everything. What causes the restoring force? Where's, what's the nature of it? Gravity. It's the gravitational force. But the gravitational force does not act in that direction that I just indicated. So the cause of the restoring force is the force of gravity it produces the restoring force. It's not equal to the restoring force. It produces it. And I touched on this earlier when we're talking about the restoring force for a mass on a spring. The force on the mass by the spring causes the restoring force, and it is the restoring force, because that's the only force. The problem here is, and we're going to draw this, because you're going to need to know this diagram for later. The problem here is, it's moving in a, in a curve. And when the pendulum, you can freehand this, just draw a gentle curve that you feel is circular in nature. And then you're going to draw your pendulum Bob, we always name the pendulum Bob, there. We don't need the string, but if you wanted to draw the string, this, well, I'm not going to draw the string because the center of this circular arc would probably be close to the top of my screen. So I would have to draw a line from the Bob way up there, and I'm not going to do that. There is only one force acting on the pendulum Bob. It is the force of gravity. Well, there's a tension force as well, I suppose, right? But we don't want to get into that. So this is the force due to gravity. Now, how can I do this? If we had, and you don't need to draw this, I'm just going to go back in time and talk about an object on a ramp. When you have an object on a ramp, and you start to talk about the force of gravity, which is down. Uh, 
that downward force of gravity due to the direction the box can move, really we break it into two components that are meaningful. We break it into a parallel component, a component that's going to be acting along the ramp, and a perpendicular component, a component that pushes the box towards the ramp. And the reason for that is that this gray vector is the same as the sum of these two vectors, right? And then what we typically do is we draw this over here, but I don't want to do that, okay? I just want to leave it like this. So gravity has a parallel component, which is down here. and a perpendicular component, which is here. You're with me? Well, I hope you see that that's exactly what we have here, except the ramp is changing direction all the time. It's not at the same angle at any particular point in time. I can very easily translate that knowledge that I've just put down on paper here and say that this force of gravity acting on the bob is doing two things. It's pulling the bob away from the center of rotation, which, by the way, is balanced by the tension. And it is moving the bob in the direction of motion. Now, that direction is going to change as soon as the bob is moving to a different place. Whatever this angle is, I guess I'm going to have to draw in the string. Whatever that angle is, it's the same as the angle the pendulum makes with the vertical. I drew it that way because, as I said, I think the center of curvature of this circle is way close to the top of the screen. But what I'm telling you is that angle theta in my diagram down here when the pendulum is at this point moving down, or up for that matter, that angle in the diagram is the angle between this string and the vertical. And this force, I don't know what you want to call it, Fg away from the center. I, it's What you call this is not relevant. It's going to be balanced by the tension anyway. But what is this force? Well, this is the restoring force. It's the force that's pushing the pendulum or pulling the pendulum or whatever word you want to use. The force exerted on the pendulum bob causing it to move in this direction, which is going to be a restoring thing. Running out of words here. It's what the restoration is all about getting it to move along that path. So this is the restoring force. It's like a parallel component of gravity, except I give you the formula for the parallel component of gravity. When I now ask you, what is the restoring force? You have to sort this out on your own or memorize something. So when the pendulum bob is making an angle of 10 degrees with the vertical, and this is absolutely exaggerated, okay? But if I draw an angle of 10 degrees, it's not going to look very nice for you. This is 10 degrees. The pendulum bob is here. The force due to gravity acting on it produces a component of gravity that is balanced by tension and, and I'm going to have to adjust my diagram here, I can see that, and perpendicular to that, it produces the restoring force. This is the force due to gravity. This angle is 10 degrees. This is what you were asked to find. So 
I don't know. If you want to memorize this formula for a pendulum, I guess go ahead. But there's a reason for it, and, and I think you know me by now. I would rather not just give you how to do a problem. I would rather you have a background of understanding what's going on. Because I think it's important, fundamentally it's important for science students, and just as important as that when you go to post-secondary, nobody's going to explain why things are working the way they are. And I, I actually had an email from a Physics 30 student from last year, a few days ago, asking me a question, and he showed me what the prof's notes looked like. And it, there's no explanation of what's going on. So the student is lost. But once it was explained to the student, well, this is what's going on, the student went, oh, okay, I get it. Post-secondary is a different beast for those of you going on to engineering and science. They don't really explain things too well at times. Not all of them. Some of them do a great job, but they're not teachers. That's not their primary job. Anyway, it's a pretty easy thing to do. What was the mass of the pendulum bob here, Christina? 250 grams. 250 grams? So this will be 0 0.0, no, 0 0.250 kilograms times G. We all know what G is, right? And the, I guess then we can multiply by the sine of 10 degrees to get the opposite side. Because sine of 10 degrees is equal to opposite, which is the restoring force over the hypotenuse, which is mg. And just like that, we're done. I believe I can kind of now explain a little bit more why the formula only works for certain angles. It turns out that the force is determined using sine. And sine, if you wanted to measure sine of this angle, you would have to measure the opposite side and the hypotenuse, wouldn't you? It's very difficult to measure the hypotenuse. It's much easier to measure the length of the pendulum because it's the same everywhere. And when you look at the opposite over the length, that's tangent, which isn't sine, but it's close enough to being sine at small angles. Anyway, I hope that made sense. I hope just looking at the pendulum in motion and doing some calculations was helpful to you. You have a number of questions dealing with pendula here. I, I don't believe that you know, you're going to have a lot of homework. Don't forget, though, that that water slide problem is due on Tuesday. Okay? And that's it for the day. Give me a second to clean things up a bit, and then I'll be around to help you out.